Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of gratitude, Hallelujah. Now we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible, and in our last video together, Moses died and Joshua arrives on the scene. But in order to understand who Joshua is, let us back up a moment and go back to the book of Numbers, and let's begin in chapter 13. Now verse 1 says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan which I give unto the children of Israel. Now Canaan at this time is occupied by the pagan people. More specifically, the children of Anak, which are the people of the giants. And we'll look at that more in a moment. God says, I've given unto the children of Israel this land of Canaan, but they must go in and take it. And so Moses in verse three, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And notice in verse 6, it says of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. In verse 8, of the tribe of Ephraim, Joshua, the son of Nun. Now, this is the same Joshua who we're going to read about much in the book of Joshua, who is the leader who leads God's people into the promised land. Now, in verse 16, it says, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land of Canaan. And Moses called Joshua, which his name means deliverer, or Yahweh saves, or salvation. It's the same name as Yeshua, or Jesus. And Jesus is, of course, the captain of God's army that will lead us eventually into the promised land. Now Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said unto them, Get you up this way southward, go into the mountain, see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell there, and report back and tell us whether they are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. If they're going to go in and take the land, they need to know what they're up against. Moses continues in verse 19 and says, Tell us what the land is like whether it be good or bad, whether it be fat or lean, and be of good courage. Bring back a sample of the fruit of the land, because it was the time of year when fruit would be producing. So they went up and they searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab, and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron. Now remember, that's where Abraham once dwelt. And the occupants of Hebron were Ahiman, Sheshai, Talmai, the children of Anak. Well, when they came, in verse 23, unto the brook of Eshcol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, they bear it between two upon a staff. Two men with a staff running across their shoulders, one in front of the other, and on this staff was a cluster of grapes. So if you can imagine that, that is a very large cluster of grapes. And after 40 days, in verse 25, they returned to Moses to tell him of all they had seen and all they had learned. And when they came to Moses, verse 26, and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, they brought back word unto them and showed them the cluster of grapes. And they said unto Moses, Aaron, and all the congregation, We came into the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it is flowing with milk and honey, and this is the fruit that we found there. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and they are very great. There are very great large walls around the city. And then notice, they say, moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. It is the Amalekites that dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. 
Now notice in verse 33, it says, we saw the giants. In the Hebrew, this is the Nephilim. This goes back to Genesis chapter six, the first couple of verses. And this would indicate that these men are the product of when the fallen angels had sexual intercourse with the women of earth. And this is what came from that seed. And so they say, we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And these giants were so large, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Now, let's pause for just a moment and take a look at a couple of passages from the Bible that expound on this idea of these children of Anak, these Nephilim. Now, if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day and to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than thyself, cities great and fenced up to heaven with very great high walls. But notice verse 2, A people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, of whom you know and whom you have heard it to be said of, who can stand before the children of Anak. So apparently these giants are great in stature, so great that when the people of Israel look upon themselves, they see themselves as grasshoppers. Well, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 2 and let's look at verse 10. It says, the Emmons dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants or Nephilim as the Anakims, but the Moabites call them Emmons. Well, now let us go back to Joshua chapter 11. And in verse 21, it says, at that time came Joshua and he cut off the Anakims. He attacked and slaughtered these giants. He destroyed them utterly with their cities. And there was none of the Anakims or the giants left in the land of the children of Israel. Now, from a biblical context, we can see that there's much information, much recorded history about these giants, that they existed. And if you would like to research this topic further, We've done an entire study, some 33, 34 videos, I believe, on the book of One Enoch, which goes into great detail about these giants. But even though the Bible seems to be closed on this topic for the most part, we can see that there are many Bible passages that speak specifically about them. Well, that brings us back to our story. The spies have gone out. They've searched the land. They've come back with the report that these giants exist, and if they're going to take the land, they must face the giants. And that's where we pick back up in our story, verse 30. It says, Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Obviously, at this report, up until this point, they are very alarmed about what they're hearing. And they're certainly not looking forward to doing what God has told them to do because there is fear in their hearts over these giants. And yet Caleb steals the people, he quiets the people, and he says unto Moses, let us go up at once and let us take the land, for we are well able to overcome it. He expounds on this in chapter 14, beginning at verse 8. He says, if the Lord delight in us, then he, the Lord, will bring us into this land. He will fight for us, and he will make a way for us and give us this land, a land which flows with milk and honey. So do not rebel against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. For the Lord is with us, do not fear. And because of his courage, based upon the relationship that he has with the Almighty, you see, the relationship comes first, and because of the relationship, courage, faith, and trust are a product of that relationship. And so Joshua and Caleb are basically saying, look, it doesn't matter how big these men appear to be. Our God is bigger. Our God is greater. He has promised the land, and therefore we must trust in him and fear not the man. And that's why God says in verse 30, doubtless, you people will not come into the land. 
concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein. The only two that will enter into the promised land will be Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they should know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and they will bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. And the number of years that they are in the wilderness is representative of the number of days in which the spies search the land, forty days. And the Lord says in verse 35, I have given my word, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me. You will be consumed in this wilderness, and here will you die. And the men, the other spies, which Moses sent to search the land, who returned and made all the congregation to murmur by fearing the giants, even those men that brought this evil report upon the land and unto the people of Israel, they died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were among the men who went to spy out the land, they lived still because of their faithful report, because of their trust and faith in God. And the men who died, died because of the evil report that they had given. And that's what we see in chapter 13, verse 31. It says, the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people, for they are stronger than we. They are bigger than we. They are mightier than we. And so they brought an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Now I wanna post a picture here for a moment so you can just get an idea in your mind of the magnitude of these giants and depending on how large they were, how easily it would be to see yourself as a grasshopper in their sight, how easily it would be to fear them and how easily it would be to understand that you as a normal human being are no match against such a force. So take a look at this picture for a moment, and then we'll continue. Now, as you can see, and as we continue in verse 33, these men, the, the spies who spied out this land, say, we saw these giants. They are the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And so they struck fear in the hearts of the people. And because of this fear, the people began to look at their circumstances what's actually in front of them rather than the God whom they serve that can deliver them and save them from all of these terrible things. And so it is with you and I, friends. There are many times in this life where we're going to face obstacles, difficulties, temptations, and trials that seem to be so large, that seem to be so overwhelming. And yet we must remember when measured against the God whom we serve, they are no match. They fade away like a puff of smoke when they are placed in the glory, the majesty, the wonder, and the awe of the living mighty God. And so I want to encourage you today to be not like the people of Israel and focus upon what is in front of you, but allow your mind and your thoughts to be exalted unto the mighty God that you serve. He's called the Almighty for a reason. There is no circumstance in this life, there is no event that will take place in this world, and there is nothing ever created that is bigger or presents an obstacle before our great God and King. They all cower in his presence. And this is what was in the hearts of Joshua and Caleb. And this is why God honored them for their faith and trust. And so it's important as we enter into the story of Joshua 
that we understand who he was, the man that he was, the relationship that he had with the Almighty. And let me leave you with what Joshua said this morning that we as the people of God can apply in our lives as well. Let's pick up in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 8. It says, if the Lord delight in us. Now that's the question. If the Lord delights in us. Well, if we are living faithfully before him, he takes great delight in us. If we are compromising the way we live our lives, if we are giving ourselves to the things of this world, if we're following our own passions and lust, then friends, the Lord takes no delight in us. But if, as Joshua and Caleb said, the Lord delights in us, then he will do great things for us. He, he will bless us spiritually speaking, beyond anything that we can imagine or think. But we must be careful and rebel not against the Lord. And we must not fear the circumstances or the people of this earth. For the Lord our God is with us. And so fear not your circumstances. Fear not man. But as Jesus said, fear God who is able to cast your soul into eternal punishment in hell, where you will forever be separated from the Lord God. Oh, friends, as we've been reminded many times in this study, the Old Testament, these stories are here for us to learn from. We can look back on the choices they made, both good and bad, and we can learn from them. We can learn to share in their successes and we can learn to learn from their mistakes. And we have both presented to us in this story. We learn from the mistake of the people of Israel not to fear the things of this world, but to place all our trust in the God whom we serve. And we learn from Joshua and Caleb not to allow ourselves to be focused and overcome and even become fearful of the things that happen in this life but to look unto God who is our great deliverer and our salvation. And that is my prayer for you today, friend. No matter what you're experiencing in this life, no matter what you're going through or you're going to face in the future, cultivate a deep relationship with the Most High in these times of plenty. So when the days of temptation come, or as Jesus said, when the storms of this life beat upon your house, you will be grounded upon a firm foundation and those storms of life will not be able to move you, much less destroy you. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so thankful again that you're here sitting under the word of God, allowing yourself to be taught by his holy word. And I pray that as you go throughout your day, you'll be often reminded of what we've discussed and that the Holy Spirit will continue to teach and enlighten you of these great truths so that you'll not only be one who is learning, but you'll be one who is practicing. Or as James said, not to be hearers of the word only, but that we would be doers of the word. Now may Yahweh, the God of the word, who is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through the enabling of the Holy Spirit, so bless you and keep you, friends, as you fight on in your journey. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.